My investigation had led me into nowhere. Walking at nights in the Ark in Massachusetts, marked with cold perspiration and queer glances of other strangers, I felt like a ghost who has succumbed to his own blatant failures. I was nearly about to give up my investigation when I got a lead from a certain peculiar woman whose grandfather has been presumably murdered in a manner which curiously tied into the case I was trying to solve for lord knows how long. Ella was quite a strange woman and seemed oddly flagrant in her ways of displaying her feminine side as she greeted me on her porch with a fully displayed nightgown leaving me in an odd situation from the first glance I dared to send her away. Nevertheless my mission was to get to know her on a strictly professional basis as this was my only lead into the rotten stench of hideous secrets that almost laid the foundation of Arkham and its grim citizenship. As I inspected the living room, I found that Ella was rather disturbed by all the things she knew and that the air carried and transmitted an almost palpable aura that seemingly reminded her of the essence and bizarre circumstances of her beloved grandfather's death. As it seemed, her grandfather was connected to some kind of a queer cult of unexplained nature which worshipped entities of paganistic order. It seemed to be unusually old and decrepit in the wild tempest of times long gone. The only thing that was truly known about the cult is that it performed some sort of satanic rituals and quite possibly drove its members to a hideous and inescapable insanity. The wild acts of the alleged cult members were long known in most Arkham circles by now, though nobody could directly attribute them to a group of such sacrilegiousness, but as the time went by, their alleged deeds showed a growth in an infinitely more sinister fashion. As to how exactly the theory of a certain all-permeating cult came about, I will expand upon a little later in my accounts of recollection. More than a dozen of alleged victims, both rich and poor, prominent and common folk alike, were found mutilated and dismembered, or left for dead while some of them still bleeding for their lives in their last hours. The thing that bounded the victims like an invisible rope of death was that every single victim had something utterly devastating in common. Their eyes were missing. None would remember the deeds done to them or be conscious enough to speak coherently and it seemed they had succumbed to a terrible madness to add to their misery. A few survivors consequently died promptly of a heart failure at the hospital, their flesh marked with ancient symbols, clearly meticulously scalped, dropping hints of utter blasphemy that soaked itself into every fiber of the city and kept spreading like a tumor with no way of stopping it. Hidden like rats in the sewers just to surface when the times were the worst, like a sheer force of demonic condemnation, the cult and its members kept an eerie link of horrors not seen yet, of known deviousness and the unknown terrors, operating in the shadows while making their presence felt, the mystery of terrifying proportions bore on Arkham and its citizens with a fiendish secrecy behind the masked face of the spiteful cult. As a private investigator, I needed to collect as much information as I could to get to the bottom of this. I have been recommended to get a hold of you by my dear friend, who has once used your detective services to find his estranged wife. You see, he became to know my situation, and he has long ago known of my grandfather's weird transformation from a kind and keen mind into a reckless hermit and devoted member of an unknown church of which he talked about incessantly as he resided in his study. My friend did notify me that you do not take upon all cases, and that you are a man who is hard to find due to your proficiency as you do not advertise your services and so the only thing I got was the address. I also want to assure you Mr. Detective that he is, after all, only my friend. You do not have to explain your private position with the gentleman, Miss Ella. I'm glad he has helped you just as much as you are helping me now. As a matter of fact, I've been tracing a certain group who I'm afraid are connected to her grandfather's killing without success for the last year. That ever since the fifth murder took place chronologically. Let's say that after that, things got a bit more personal for some of my clients and myself. And please, call me Blake. Blake Carter. Tell me, Miss Quinn. 
did your grandfather mention anything about the so named cult? Some common folk called them a cult of elders for some reason. You see, Detective Carter, he was almost never at home, and when he did come home, he always crept into his study in the dead of night. How shall I put it? He was not particularly fond of socializing. I see. Well, Ella, could I get a look inside his study? We should go there, first and foremost. Surely. It's on the second floor. I'll guide you there. As I was following Ella, in my passing I saw many odd statues and relics made eons ago, placed in queer corners as if hidden from an unsuspecting eye. Inside the house that could be called a mansion, and that without any great confusion, dwelt objects of infinite strangeness and peculiarity. Some of the things were wild depictions of some life forms, never before seen in any biological nor anthropomorphic study, described by some humongous Darwinistic tome. It almost seemed that no human could ever conceive of such forms, and even looking at them almost made me visibly shiver, as fear of the unknown and mysterious beings out of time came over and before me in an absolutely indescribable manner. Ella ascended the steps in front of me, and that in an almost bizarre fashion, as if displaying her curvy winding gown, all the while intentionally trying to pull at my emotional strings of certain nature. This did not make my job any easier, as there crept in me a tangible yet unconscious feeling of unease concerning the house and its strange habitant Ella and her estranged grandfather that never stopped until we finally left the old house that night. As the case stood, all of the victims so far accounted for 15 alleged cult murders, that including Ella's grandfather, thus presently becoming the latest one, but who died soon thereafter in the hospital, without murmuring as much as a single word. As a detective I could conceive of a notion of a brutal serial killer, as Arkham has known a few deranged wretched men like Dave Cosby, whose followers and copycats alike have gained a certain notoriety, if not for a detail of uttermost and as we found out later, cosmic consequences laid the fury improbable. The eyes of all the victims, including Ella's grandfather, were almost surgically removed in a seemingly impossible fashion, as if burnt out. But not a single specialist I consulted could understand how could this happen. They could not for the life of them identify how this was possible before the rigor mortis, as surviving such horror was highly unlikely. It seemed that all the victims had the procedure done while they were still alive. A certain witness came forth not a while ago, stating that he saw a group of men dressed in all white hooded robes, with blasphemous signs leaving a site where one of the victims was eventually found. The strangeness of such religiously queer killings and such testimonies could not allow for any other conclusion than to what I came to consequently. The cult, as if a group of highly sophisticated people, somehow, some way, made these killings happen. Even though the local police had no clue as to how or why the murders came about, they were reluctant to admitting it as not to be judged for their incompetency in a court of public opinion. They most certainly understood that blatant facts of the markings on the bodies, as well as all the other evidence, pointed to an organized group of sacrilegious individuals, yet kept trying to divert the public and media's attention elsewhere by making the crime seem random like mob vendettas and such, with no seeming clear pattern to be recognized. The police also managed to rationalize their mishaps publicly by pointing that if it indeed was an organized religious group, as some were pointing out, the visual cues of costumes and signs would be sufficient enough to be positively identified by any witnesses or bystanders, and thus the former would be almost immediately apprehended. Thus police, at least officially, brushed off the theory of any organized satanic cult and proceeded the investigation with certain familiarity, which I knew was a big and arrogant mistake to make, and I, to my cosmic dread, was about to find out how right I was. After long hours in the study, me and Ella have searched through all the corners and scraped all the dusty tomes of antiquity of which there were plenty. 
One of the last objects we have found was an ancient relic-like box with a seal of unknown and grotesque lock with symbols of ancient deities protecting it from intrusion. I tried to open it with every lock-picking method I ever had at my disposal. Ultimately, nothing worked. We understood that it could be our only clue to Ella's grandfather's untimely demise, so we had to pry it open somehow, as if the secrets contained in the box were of abnormal importance. After what seemed like too many ill attempts, I finally took the box outside in the rainy backyard of the Grim Manor in an almost feverishly nervous anticipation of deep buried secrets awaiting to be uncovered. Ella. Step away from the box, I told her while pointing my gun at the direction of the box and cocking it. You gonna shoot it? Just before she got to finish her sentence, the ring of the hollow box protruded our surroundings. The box was opened wide, and from it I managed to recover a peculiar legal note, much to the dismay of Ella, who was still in shock from the shot as it did come off as very loud in the dark, complete silence of the rainy yard. In the box was contained a legal encumbrance and a sort of a testament on a certain church in the Ark of Massachusetts, though the address seemed strangely unfamiliar to me. The encumbrance explicitly stated that the name church belongs to Ella if something should happen to her now deceased grandfather. Most importantly, however, was that the church could not be passed on to any person outside of Ella's family for at least three generations. This bizarre detail struck me, as I did not know the accordance of such claim to fundamental law practices, but in case it really had a legal merit, then this church should be of particular interest in the context of the whole mystery. It seemed that Ella's grandfather, besides apparently owning the mentioned church, served a role similar to a vicar in the parish, thus being a high-level priest as well, and thanks to these revelations, Ella was now quite negatively startled to something she had no clue about till this very evening. I did not know my grandfather owned a whole church here, said Ella, deeply disturbed, swallowing her words in a sudden gasp of tears. I was born into a wealthy family, yes, but Detective Blake, do you think somebody could have known of this document? Could it be the reason for my grandfather's demise? I tried to calm Ella and gently embraced her as professionally as I could. I can't say I was not disturbed by all the recent revelations myself. Where is the church, Ella? I do not know. As later events unfolded in uncanny fashion, we have found in the study a map of Harkham and its suburbs, and with little research became completely convinced for ourselves that there is such a place, though it was not clear why it was strangely unmarked as to have any building let alone a church. Consequently, we took a competent older cab driver and asked him to deliver us to this address unknown. When we arrived at the outskirts of Arkham, we understood that despite a number of great buildings around the area, this whole place seemed largely unpopulated for a town of this size. What we had immediately found was a tremendous church, or even a cathedral of gothic magnitude of epic proportions in grossly immeasurable size, just like the pictures of Notre Dame de Paris, as I remember from the photos I once marveled as a child. However, as we tried to look around, our cab driver refused to wait for us condemning the place as sinful. He labeled the place as a point of cataclysmic terror and was not willing to stay there for any one minute, not for any sum of money or any form of oral persuasion. Looking back it was ironic how he crossed himself and then pushed on the gas pedal as the church should be a symbol of something holy and virtuous. As he drove away we exchanged glances seemingly understandful of the whole unsettledness we came upon, yet still decided to enter the chapel in case it was indeed open to visitors as the hour was not late. The large decorated wooden door, despite its immense massive proportions, swung open swiftly while entering the chapel in itself, felt like infiltrating into a whole different dimension of a cursed cryptic substance. 
there at the entrance we immediately found steps that were leading us to some sort of a balcony or a second floor, just figuring by ourselves that going there would raise less suspicion if by improbable case had we been expected. In the dark, the gothic features of the ornaments and massive walls and ceilings alike painted with long forgotten colors from cornerstones and pillars of strange societies long gone and had thus forced a feeling of subtle unease and restless anxiety. Ella clutched my hand as we passed through the long corridors with endless pits of odd structures. On one hand, the interior could not be more magnificent and inspiring of awe. On the other, a sheer sense of malignancy somewhere in the lurking shadows beyond the eye was gradually becoming more and more condensed. As we pushed on within the maze of disturbing corridors, Ella began mumbling something indiscernible to herself while clutching my hand with such force it would even hurt and I started to worry as this was, after all, my shooting hand. As fear was tightening its grip on me, I found a sense of comfort in the fact that I brought my gun with me, not like a detective could afford to be without one. I had never walked in that wretched church if I was unarmed, as in my mind it seemed to me almost like a suicide attempt for some odd reason, and that besides and well beyond the fact that I've been in numerous tense situations before. Yet this place was something else. As we moved closer into the center of the humongous structure of the cathedral, we started to notice gushes of wind coming clearly from the other side. We were approaching something, and in the halls dim light flickering started to appear and strange sounds started entering the frame. We have ventured beyond normal confines of usual spaces. The chill of the mind's shadow filled with lurking, grotesque imagery started to become more palpable. The stench of fear was now obvious to me as Ella was becoming clearly and blatantly terrified. I started to feel a bizarre sensation in my stomach as if a tight space of fear of infinite capacity that never known to me was beginning to form and multiply through all the parts of my body, slowly consuming every organ, every cell in its paralyzing path. Stay close by me, Ella. <laughs> Ella mumbled barely audibly. Suddenly we entered a large hole that came upon us so fast it almost felt we somehow accidentally stumbled upon it. We were standing and looking ahead from a sort of lodge or a balcony of high altitude onto the high renaissance ceiling within the space so large it almost seemed it had no walls. A bare arena of surreal fresks surrounded by a blasphemous sense of grotesque rituals and wildest occult practices and yet protruded with a seemingly beautiful coordination of colors, images and sounds far beyond anything ordinary and plain. Now it was clear that the sounds that we heard in the hallway were the sounds coming from below our level. There, in the center, rose up an altar and from that rose an obelisk of epic proportions which oddly enough we did not notice upon entering the chapel, with people in white robes and chants of certain blasphemous kind arising in a strange rhythm of dance of profane accursed mockery. Chaotic and mesmerizing cacophony of hideous and queer syllables in some kind of unknown language were echoing through all the space and by their sheer convincing strength drilled into ear and poisoned the mind with slow protruding unsettledness of extreme nature of this demonic festivity at hand. Even I, in my most reticence, could not bear the feeling anymore. There was something even more queer and bizarre about the whole thing, however. No clear light source was present, even though one could clearly see a couple of chandeliers, but their candles were either half-lit or extinct completely. The light seemed to be forming a peculiar oval-like shape around the obelisk, thus emanating enough of it for us to see the chanting figures clearly, but nothing beyond, which made the whole ordeal even more sinister, because a large portion of the cathedral was unknown, hidden in the midst of darkness. We got to get out! Ella cried out all of a sudden. You hear me? Get out! 
I got instantly afraid that the hooded man below would hear us, but despite Ella's gripping fear, she did not yell from the top of her lungs, which would be a very unwise thing to do, considering the circumstances. And thankfully I was proven right, as not a single man was seemingly startled, nor turned to face us, or even stop his mantra. But strangely, at this exact time, however, the echoing incantations escalated, and it almost seemed as if they were growing more perverse in their nature of random moans and screams and yells, melting together, infiltrating and reverberating through all forms surrounding us. It almost seemed like the cultists were aware of our presence via some kind of other much more malicious medium from the start, managing to not show signs of their disturbance while their growing sounds engrossed us and almost clutched us physically in this wild dance of disgusting travesty and deeply frightful treacherous mimicry of everything that was unholy and perverse. With spellcasters' voices growing ever so intense and intimate, I shrugged off the cobwebs from my mind and looked at Hela, who was now visibly shaking from unutterable loathsome horror of this cryptic, ugly, mind-devouring place. Yes, Ella, we're leaving right now and calling the police immediately. Suddenly, at this very moment, in a swift, impossible move, she lifted off the ground and floated upwards, releasing a cold whirlwind that manifested itself as a freezing breeze on my already chilly, fear-ridden cheeks. The air now emanated frost and visible iciness and it felt it almost got sucked out of the chapel as Ella sprung into the air, screaming and gasping, floating in a serendipitous and awfully horrendous manner and so by instinct I grabbed my gun and pointed at the crowd below but was quickly shaken up by the cultists who were now conspicuously watching our every move from the dark pits below of hellish obelisk which features became queerly obscured in a horrid and completely detestable manner. As the distance grew and Ella flew farther away from the balcony, I understood that grip of sheer spiteful terror had overtaken me. Every single nerve in my stomach was sprung into aliveness by an endless sense of dread and panic that I have not ever felt before. I yelled at the unknown sinful brotherhood below in infinite condemnation as they were still watching me, completely still immovable like the obelisk and whose outrageous gaze was reticent of the obscene and unimaginable sadistic horrors yet to come. Promptly, by blind animalistic instinct, I fired three shots at the men below. To my surprise, the bullets vanished one by one into the darkness, but there was no impact. In fact, there was no sound accompanying the bullets hitting anything solid. The men stood like statues without a single clue in their body language of any disharmony with their faces covered with bleak white continuous cloaks that reached the floor in their surrealistic monstrous fashion. I understood then and there that shooting them was pointless and that my gun will not suffice in any situation that this wretched clean place was going to yet plunge me into. Losing my balance, as if succumbing to a terrible madness of our predicament, I took a look at Ella, who floated away more and more into the numbing darkness of the cathedral, while her features started to get more and more distorted by the odd flickering dance of light and shadow in this merciless blasphemous place of horrific condemnation damnation and deadly lethargy. I could still see her face clearly, and as I looked at her fading away, I felt such emptiness and sudden rush of solitude one could never describe in comprehensible common words. I began to understand that in some strange way, in our moments together, I grew fond of her, even if I could not bring myself together to accept it at the time. As I stood there in stupor, robbed of all my senses, feeling like I was about to magically flow too, away from the space into somewhere blissful and almost hoping for a quick and deadly blow to my own forehead to stop all this madness, I heard, at first barely audibly, a distant scream. Then the dreaded words became more obvious and the chilling meaning of them grew on me in an instance. Shoot me! Shoot me now! Please, I beg you to shoot me. 
The time stood incredibly still, like there was a cosmic rupture of immense proportions. In my failed attempt to land a shot at the monsters below, I would never think that Ella would rather ask me to kill her than let her be given up to this esoteric order's rapture. With shaky, fear-ridden hand, I unsteadily pointed the barrel towards her. My grip tightened on the trigger cold sweat of panic stemming from my inner conflict, I was trying to hold on to every bit of sanity that I needed to hit my mark. If I only known what would happen next, I would shoot both Ella and myself just to escape the sight of what I was about to witness in this godforsaken place. Do it, I beg you, for the love of Lord, do it! With horrific tremble in my joints, I prepared myself to face the inevitable. Ella will be thrown into the claws of these monsters, or she will be just crushed from the sudden fall from this height. Should the gravity regain its power again over these otherworldly mystical influences that have overtaken the cathedral? Ella, now further away, seemed to slowly descend, while all of a sudden, the cultists have synchronically turned their cold gaze towards the flying beauty. I cannot let this happen. She will be tortured, killed, mutilated like the others, or even worse. Quickly, I pointed my gun towards Ella. Drained of all the life energy, I barely had ability to conceive no more than a longing look of farewell and enough power to pull the trigger. And yet I hesitated again, like I still had some glimpse of hope that some kind omen or divine interference would stop this other madness from progressing any further. But deep down inside I understood this will not happen. I had to pull the trigger right this very moment. All the while I wavered, Ella was crying, making one of the most horrible, painful, gut-wrenching sound in what felt like her final moments of existence fatally pressing up on her. I couldn't hesitate no more. With the gun in my hand, I took full aim at her head. Her death would be painless if I just managed to keep my hand straight. Shoot me. Shoot me. It was at this very moment, just as I was faced with the most horrendous choice of my life, something even more obnoxious and even more loathsome and revolting happened. A quick, spreading flash of spearing blue light of cosmic proportions entered from the obelisk's elder being tentacle-like clutches to the forefront, making cultists instantly fall on their knees and start chanting one of the most disturbing, disfigured babbles I could ever be acquainted with by the most blasphemous human tongue. The magical surge of light now extended magnificently and even hypnotically into the center of the altar frame. It was impossible to take eyes off of, as it was just as beautiful as it was dreadfully devastating to watch. Slowly and meticulously extending into space around it, consuming all of the cultists one by one in the process, with their moans gradually transformed from joyous mumbles of ecstatic profanity to yells of sheer agony and first deprecating squeals of death and from the gush of light of the obelisk before came a creature and there it stood a thing with thousand eyes watching in full-blown chaos all and everything at every conceivable direction it was an abomination of the highest order stirring haphazardly covered in slime of some liquid substance with a shape not ever to be known to any human being with awkwardly placed humongous mouth and distorted lips of gigantic proportions. The spiteful creature was about 20 feet tall and it almost seemed that time and space were warped around its stature as if it was the center of the known universe. Oh god, I can't stand it. This is madness. This is bottomless pit of agony, chilling to the bone and rupturing whatever merit of existence I ever thought or ever conceived in my mind. That perplexing, infinite, indefinite form of uttermost proportions made my eyes suck its crave to be burnt out like all the rest of the victims just to not be able to witness anything about this monstrosity. 
If I could not see a fascinating sunset nor contours of the most gorgeous women of earth anymore, I was willing to give all that up just to stop seeing of that filth which was right in front of me. That blasphemous fiend of utter ridiculousness, the ghoul of unimaginable horror, could by the sheer look of it make the most brave individual cry out from instant dementia, as if this hound of being can penetrate the human anatomy and crawl seamlessly into morphing with it from an unseen gate and just like a virus infect all tissues of men. Concentrated yet out of place, stirring, crawling breed of most disgusting tentacle-like claws one could ever imagine from the most vile of horror stories was standing there, delivering, shivering and lingering as if almost protruding your very core, your very soul with relentless panic and reverberating it to you in the back of your mind over and over and over again. This disgust of the worst kind was giving me cold shivers and a rush of fever I never had in my worst sickness. I tried to unsee what I seen and I begged for mercy of gods, for I didn't care for what gods could bestow their help upon me, if plural or singular, if Greek or modern. I just wanted out of it. The monster came closer and a heavy touch of madness brushed over me. With its liquid-like form, a squid pulsating of most irrational growth patterns seeming like something new of sheer disgust was born out of its rotten limbs, its scornful ligaments out there penetrating and mongering of the worst things yet to come, being ephemeral and real at the same instant, a horror of oldest and yet newest form of insanity buried deep down in annals of every human subconscious as it floated, or walked, or crawled, saturated joyful in its reincarnation of abysmal fear it brought out in a petty ant like me it made serene progress it made it clear i was its slave then the creature opened itself from the inside out pouring out now a yellowish liquid of bodily vomit like regurgitations and fluids that instantly filled the chapel with a smelling stag of rotten excrements of a thousand barn cows put together and a ratchet bone crushing mouth like opening was delivered in a satanic ritual of cosmic proportions revealing that the mouth had razor sharp claw like teeth as the abomination drew itself closer from the infinite abyss, leaving me mesmerized, ignoring in a cold stupor the ever-distancing silenced screams of Ella, who was now completely out of sight, not to mention out of range, in the darkest depths of the cathedral possibly beside or by now, somehow, even inside the monster, I managed to gather myself enough with my last bit of crumbling sanity to get my gun out in an attempt to shoot the damn thing, but in that same instant I stopped myself and thought that no bullet can hurt this detestable being, and so I understood right then and there that the only way to end this madness was to push the barrel on my temple and pull the trigger. Even a mere thought of it came like a sudden cool wave of relief as I was waiting for it in a time span of what seemed like an eternity. I had no final words, I had nothing in my mind which seemed sweeter than blissful forgetfulness and so I pushed my gun to my temple and at the moment's notice squeezed the trigger in as hard as I could. As the click popped, all my nerves stopped responding and a feeling of ease washed over me as a cool summer breeze would shimmer on a summer yacht deep in the middle of an endless warm ocean. I was no more. I was away.
After a few blissful moments, only one strange thing in my dream, what seemed like otherworldly, penetrated itself as disgusting growls of the terrible abomination queerly remained for some reason. A terrible panic had snatched me once again, as I understood that this demonic force had trapped me in my lucid dream of death to that endless perpetual cycle of nightmare. It was my fate to be trapped in this feast of rot and company of fallen angels manifested in this beast of hellish magnitude that was going to swallow up my terror, to feed itself just as a pendulum needs to be rocked, to not lose its amplitude to opposing forces. Then, all of a sudden it occurred to me that I was actually standing and still had full control of my limbs, that I remained alive as if by some ill-advised miracle that I begged for, and in a very odd manner the fall shot from an empty clip made me forget my consciousness and feel a sense of true peace and tranquility. But the most bizarre thing about it all was that my gun did not shoot for some reason, while the clip should have been clearly charged by all accounts. It felt like the madness finally revealed itself, manifesting into utter impossibility of current outcome. And now, gripped with an insane fear, I found myself running, stumbling, falling down over and rising clumsily, bound in an endless cycle of labyrinths and pits of the chapel, crying and laughing hysterically along the way, mesmerized, trying to not smash myself upon the solid rocks of foundation of this monstrous building that has bred horrors of such magnitude I could not ever comprehend. I could see cultists, ghosts, rotting flesh of the dead in a swirlwind of great confusion between the real and insane, between hallucination and sanity. I was running in circles, thinking that this chapel is just as endless and just as unbound as the universe itself. When I finally hit the entrance with all my bodily mass, applied by a sheer providence of divine luck, and got a sudden rush of fresh breath of Arkham's air in light of full moon, I exclaimed to myself in some kind of a weird frenzy of a man who has seen and experienced true hell. If I came out of the front door, or some other escape, or even the window, I could not grasp as my mind was so heavily clouded in maddening deafness of horrors I experienced, I felt I could not have differentiated between the above nor below. The rain almost cleansed me now, and as I'm writing this afterwards, I don't even remember how I got into a local bus and drove to my home from Arkham outskirts, shivering and mumbling much to the dismay and amazement of passengers of queer sentences and words completely incomprehensible like I just escaped some kind of a distant mental institution. I don't remember how I got into my bed with my soaked rainy clothes, nor how I slept slept for a full day and night afterwards. All I can say that the next week was spent by me, not answering a single mail or a call, nor a single client of mine. I locked myself in my room and enjoyed the stench of dust and home walls of my decrepit apartment filled with a scent of smoke and wooden flavored whiskey as I tried to forget every single damn detail about that night in that godforsaken and devilish queer cathedral of bizarre imaginings and satanic rituals. While I'm writing this I still see nightmares about the place, how the abomination is eating my guts and how LA is screaming while the accursed cultists continue to sing their horrific songs in the most ear-piercing distorted melody rising from the beyond, awakening in the cold sweat, heart pounding like it's going to blast out of my ribcage, I still imagine poor Ella and how I should have shot her when I had the chance, as I have no doubt it would be a mercy on her soul. Poor thing was begging me to kill her, rather than give her up to these savages and that atrocious abomination with all their sacrilegious sacrifices and horrible soul torturing esoteric festivities. What they have done now to her, I do not even want to imagine, and it was all because of me. Because of me, not paying attention and standing there in panic and in stupor. What have you done, Blake? What have I done? 
I just want to hope that she fell from that height eventually and lost her consciousness permanently so she will not experience the horrific body mutilations nor mind destroying torture or lord forbid find herself being alone with that freakish abnormality. Gosh, she was so young, full of life, beautiful and vibrant, with quite a kind soul and a keen mind as I have noticed. What a tragedy. And not only have I failed her, I failed her grandfather, who at least would want his granddaughter protected and to be well. And I also failed the innocent victims and their families. I failed them all. It does not matter that I was not ready for that eye-soaring deformity that came in that wretched chapel. Since I returned to my apartment barely conscious and alive, right on the next day I promptly decided to come to the local police precinct. And despite few of my connections within the local law enforcement, nobody seemed to believe me nor the things I saw in the outskirts of Arkham. It was right then and there that I understood that they will not take me seriously and that I couldn't mention Ella's disappearance, nor even the fact that she was with me at the time, else they would suspect that I was dangerously insane and maniacally deranged lunatic who had killed her. They would check Ella's house and uncover her timely departure and would have known by my very own admission her last location and companion who was me and so it would be as if it was I who was responsible for her mysterious disappearance, thinking I've hidden the body. They could also find plenty of evidence of me being in her grandfather's study since we turned the place upside down and discover missing documents and maybe even find a witness who heard the shot I made when trying to open the box thus prompting a swift and more than possible conviction following with life imprisonment or my electrocution. Thus I remained quiet of the ultimate horror of Ella's demise that was plaguing me and what led to our acquaintance with this ridiculously omnipresent cult of death. They all laughed at my crazy blabbing testimony about mysterious cults and orders of ancient satanic terror and said that I should take a break from the case or else I would be sent into a loony bin. They seemed completely disconcerned with the fact that I could have some knowledge of the cult suspected in all these murders and simply told that they will handle the case themselves and don't need the help of an incompetent amateur detective, the latter of course being absolutely absolutely not true. I think even my contacts and small time informants in the force felt I was going insane despite the fact that I'm far from a rookie and deserve their trust in any such occasion, although the occasion presented seemed quite surreal still. Even to me, I came out of the precinct feeling utterly insulted and at the same time feeling totally guilty for Ella's current predicament as if her memory and all of our efforts were to be in vain for all eternity. Even so, I should have done at least something to not allow Ella to perish like that. And now, not only have I lost her, but I have lost any authentic lead to this investigation with her apparent death. Now I can only speculate on what had really happened out there in the dismal place of wickedness and besides the fact that I have no real evidence to present to the sanctimonious police officials nor by any rational and self-preserving accounts should I ever try to step into that humongous wicked crypt again, maybe I should accept that I shall never find the truth. Nor would I ever know where to start now, as Ella's heritage was the only missing piece to this puzzle, while the case itself has now come full circle. I also saw no witnesses at all near the chapel when I entered it, nor while I exited the place, even with my hazy view after the preceding events unfolded. The lot was empty of all folk, and even if I'm not a superstitious man, but it almost smelled of a some kind of devilish trap laid to bear by some entity a human mind could not ever dare to comprehend, to lure us in and capture us like rats in the walls. So the only possible thing I could now ever do is to return to the madness that is the church of the queer cult of Elder Order. 
It still seems very strange that I never knew of the church's existence before seeing the address on the slope of paper in the study, and no matter how I tried to rationalize my thoughts around the subject, it was as if it appeared there by itself. The fact made it abundantly clear for me that I was now even more terribly afraid of going near this church once more than I could have previously imagined. But Ella might still be there, maybe she's still alive and trapped, pleading for mercy to which a shot in the head would seem as though a blessing from the clutches of this horrendous cult of centuries old decadence and deep seethed fear. But there is no one to help me in this matter, yet still, I do need to pull myself together and go back out there if there is even smallest of possibilities that she might still be alive, even if at the moment I do not feel like a hero and more like an utter coward. I am quite a hard-boiled private eye, yes, and I have saved some lives over the years, but how can I save someone from a universal, ancient horror of this magnitude, which sends the chills down my bones for every of my waking moment, paralyzing and gripping me without mercy, relentlessly trapping me in an endless nightmare? And even if I would sacrifice my mind and my body, there is no sound guarantee that I can ever save her from there, not with the things I saw in the chapel. By all accounts, she must be already dead. It was just at this time, as my inner conflict was the tensest, when the thoughts surrounding me were the bleakest and the mounting fury inside me was the strongest, I suddenly heard a loud and hard knock on my door. The sound turned all my guts inside out. Who could it be? Maybe the abomination came to finally get me, or was it the police sniffing something out, or the cult itself, or maybe it was just the friendly neighborhood milkman, though the problem was, there could be no milkman at this time of night. I stood up in a quick fashion, grabbed my gun from the table, body stiff and throbbing from the pumping of my blood heart beating so fast I thought it could be heard louder through the door than the rain beating outside upon my porch. Slowly but surely, I approached the old wooden door and with a trembling voice and a shaky sweaty palm reaching for the handle, I asked as confidently as I could muster the courage inside of me, though my voice sounded quite the opposite eventually. Who's there? No answer. With shaking fear-stricken hands, I send a tremble down the door handle and in an act of a sudden rage and boiling over with total disregard of my own life and safety, I expeditiously open the door in a rapid motion to shock anyone who might be behind it. A blatant cold shiver engulfed me immediately. It's me, Blake. Could you please let me in? There. In the dark corridor behind the wooden door stood Ella.